Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are indeed glorious. We long to see you. We long to be in your presence. We cannot wait for the day until we are conformed to the image of your own glory, when we will approximate your character and your person as far as it is possible for finite beings to resemble you. Lord, we love you. We pray now as we open your word uh, that you would be glorified once again, that we would uh, sit and hear and soak in as worshipers. And may we revere you. May we be humbled by your truth, encouraged by your truth. May we glorify you in it. Help us by your Holy Spirit for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you're being seated, I'd love for you to find your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans. And we will be looking this morning at Romans 8, 28 to 30. When you have need of security, you are likely to select someone bigger than you, stronger than you, powerfuler, intimidatinger than you. Bouncers are big people. Offensive linemen are large men. You don't want a scrawny security guard. You want somebody who is big and strong and powerful to ward off threats and enemies. When it comes to eternal security, the believer needs something bigger and powerfuler than himself. Bigger and stronger than your own ability to persevere. Bigger and stronger than your own efforts at sanctification. Bigger and stronger than your own ability to know and follow God's word. What we need if we are to be eternally secure is found only in God. This morning, we're continuing our look at the believer's security that begins with no condemnation and, and ends with no separation, this glorious chapter of Romans 8. And, and this morning, we come to our security being grounded in infinite things, infinitely strong, unassailable things, specifically the glory of God and the grace of God. Christian, this is where your security lies, not in you. But in the glory of God, God's commitment to his own glory, and in the grace of God, his free, unmerited favor bestowed on those whom he chooses to love. These are our security. We're going to read of these things here in this magnificent paragraph, Romans 8, 28 to 30. Read with me. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. How infinite realities can be contained in such a small paragraph. <laughs> Truths without limit encapsulated in a few short sentences. The bottom line of Romans 8, 28 to 30 is this, believer, your security is grounded in God's grace and in his glory. The Father's commitment to glorify His own Son results in six acts of grace that guarantee believers' security. We're going to outline this passage by looking at those six acts of grace. They all flow out of the purpose statement that God gives to exalt His own Son. And these six acts of God's sovereign grace guarantee the believers' eternal security. I want you to see the purpose statement first, then we'll back up and look at these six features of God's sovereign grace. The purpose here in verse 29, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And then you get this, so that statement. This is the result of God's saving work, and it is the purpose of God's saving work, and the purpose and the result are identical. God gets what he aims for. 
and God's purpose that he set out to accomplish is stated for us in the middle of verse 29, that he, that is Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren. And we'll come back and unfold what this means for Jesus to be the firstborn among many brethren. But just understand that that is the purpose statement at which all of these other things aim. The glory of God through the exaltation of the Son is the terminus. It is the glorious end of God's plan of salvation. And you and I who are saved benefit from God's commitment to his own glory and God's commitment to exalt his own son. You and I benefit from that. We receive grace upon grace because of God's commitment to his own glory. And because God is committed to his own glory in an unswerving fashion, that he is in fact bringing every single atom in the universe in all of time, space, and history into conformity with the perfection of his will, because God is committed to that for his own glory. It means that if he sets out to save sinners, it cannot fail. From eternity past to eternity future, there is an unbreakable chain of God's salvific activities for the benefit of sinners like you and me, grounded in his glory with the purpose terminating in the exaltation of his own son. That is where all of this is headed. And so as we unfold these six glorious acts of God's sovereign grace, They all terminate right there in his glory. The exaltation of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The first one is what we covered last week. This is Romans 8, 28. God's meticulous sovereignty secures believers' highest good. God's meticulous sovereignty secures believers' highest good. That is, God is working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Chapter... 8 verse 28 is a remarkable statement, but it's followed up with an explanation. Do you notice in verse 29 the simple word for? This is explaining a causal relationship. It, it should be translated, can be translated because. Everything is working out for good for believers because of what follows in verses 29 and 30. Why does every element and every agent in God's vast universe? often contrary to its own nature and its abilities and intentions, cooperate with every other element and agent in God's universe? Why do they together collaborate and conspire to bring about the good and the glory of the children of God? Why must angels and demons, why must sunshine and storms work together for the good of those who love God? Because, verses 29 and 30, God seeks to exalt his son. That's where this is going. Verses 29 and 30 are the ground of the promise that all things work together for good. All things working together for good because God desires to exalt the son. That is the relationship of these verses. It means this, the glory of God is your security, Christian. The grace of God is your security. Of course, no merit in you can be your security. No Godward impulse in you. And nothing intrinsic to your original nature. This is all of grace, all of God. Because God has set his affections on you, believer. He has loved you, and he loves you, and he will love you into unceasing eternities. Why does God make everything work together for your good? Because he has set his affections on you personally before time began. And he does everything required to secure your presence with him forever because he desires to exalt his son. That leads us to the second aspect of God's grace we see here in 29 to 30. God's initiating love secures believers' unmerited place. God's initiating love secures believers' unmerited place. You don't deserve to be in God's family. You don't deserve to be in heaven. You don't deserve to experience glory in his presence. To be part of God's family is an undeserved place, a place of prominence, a place of honor, a place of inestimable privilege that you and I have no business participating in. And yet it is God's initiating love that secures our place there. Notice what... Paul says here, for those whom he foreknew, 
Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Those whom he foreknew. At face value, this word foreknew may just seem to mean something like, well, he knew it before. And the word is used like that in a couple of places, sometimes of God, that that God knows a thing that happens before it happens. It's also used of people. Um, In Acts 26.5, Paul is talking about the Jews. They have known about me for a long time that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And, And Paul says there, they foreknew that I was a Pharisee just like them. He doesn't mean that they were prescient, <laughs> that, that they could see the future, that they were uh, you know, reading tarot cards or something like that. He just means prior to the time now, they knew something. And, and so the word can mean that. A, a couple of times, it just simply means to know before. But overwhelmingly, the word foreknow in the New Testament refers to something much more important than simply knowing something ahead of time. And notice in this context, what is foreknown is not a what, but a who. Those whom he foreknew. Do you understand? This knowledge is not about something that you would do or what anybody would do, but this is the knowledge of God of you. It's God knowing you. This is God's choice to set his affections upon an individual. And this picks up the very idea of the Hebrew word to know, to know. And we go all the way back to the beginnings of our Bible and find this word, Genesis 4.1, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore a son. Do you understand the meaning of know in Genesis 4.1? It's intimate, personal, relational knowledge. Genesis 18.19 God says, for I have chosen, literally the Hebrew word is our word to know, I have known him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. God is saying, I knew Abraham. And it gets translated, I chose Abraham. Now, that does not mean that God knew that Abraham existed. God's, of course, omniscient and knows that everybody exists. For God to express, I know Abraham, is to express what Adam expressed in terms of a relational, personal knowledge. God knew Abraham. In other words, God chose Abraham. God loved Abraham. Listen to the way the word is used in Psalm 1-6. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. What do you mean? God doesn't know the way of the wicked? He isn't aware of how they live? No, of course he's aware. He has cognizance of everything, but personal relational love and affection for the way of the righteous. Jeremiah 1.5, Jeremiah says, or the Lord says of him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In other words, before Jeremiah existed, God knew him personally. This is God setting his affections on an individual. He goes on and says, I've appointed you a prophet to the nations before you were born. Amos 3.2, God says of Israel, the nation, you only have I known among all the families of the earth. And Amos gets translated chosen. You only have I chosen, but it's the same Hebrew word. You only have I known. That is God set his love and affection on the nation of Israel. 1 Corinthians 8.3 Paul says, if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Do you understand? The New Testament is using the same word the same way. God's knowledge of people here is personal, relational knowledge. Galatians 4, 9, you've come to know God or rather be known by God. Of course, God knows everybody that exists, but believers are known by God. Not just mere cognizance, but personal relationship by affectionate love. Listen to the contrast on Jesus' lips in Matthew 7, 23. I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Jesus knows all about what they did. He he knows every detail of their life from beginning to end, but, but he says, I did not know you. Meaning, he wasn't in a personal, loving relationship with those consigned to destruction. To know in in these usage is to differentiate, to choose, to set one's affections on, to love. And when God is said to know people, 
Of course, he's omniscient, but his knowing people in this way describes a knowing with affection, a knowing with approval. It is personal and intimate. It is God calling someone his own. And so now for God to foreknow someone, it simply means that God foreloved them. That is, God set them apart in love before time began. That is, God was pre-acquainted with his people. He pre-associated himself with them. He has personally called them his own long before they were ever born. Listen to this usage in 1 Peter 1, 2. Believers are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. And in 1 Peter 1.20, even Christ was foreknown before the foundation of the world and has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. This foreknowledge is foreloving. It is intimate relationship before time began. What's significant about God's foreknowledge, His choosing, His setting His love on people before they were born, is it is the essence of grace It is the essence of grace. That is, it's unearned, unmerited. God did not wait around to see how you would turn out. He, He knew you from before the beginning. And He set His love on you personally. Before you were born. Before you sinned. Before you believed. Your faith is not the cause of God's love. Your good works could never be the cause of God's affection for you. How you turn out could not be the cause of God's love. What is the cause of God's love? Foreknowledge does not mean that God looks down the corridors of time to see and to respond to the ones who would choose to love him, as the 4th and 5th century heretic Pelagius said. Foreknowledge in verse 29 precedes predestination. Do you see that? Those whom he foreknew, these he called. These he predestined, these he justified, these he glorified. The foreknowledge precedes all of these things. This is God's initiating love. He takes the initiative. He's not waiting around. His love is not a response to anything. God's love is free. It's undeserved, and God's love is unflinching and unwavering. It's not affected by circumstances. It's not affected by the behavior of those on whom he sets his affections. And because God's love is not contingent on anything in the object of his love, his love for you, Christian, can never change. It can never go away. It can never be diminished. He cannot replace you with some other object of affection. God's love is not subject to circumstance. His love is rock-solid security because it originates in him depends only upon him, and he does not waver. God's initiating love secures the believer's unmerited place in God's heart, in God's family, in God's eternal, glorious presence. The love of God is great security, Christian, because it is stronger than anything opposed to it. There's a third act of God's grace that secures our eternal destiny. God's predetermination secures believers' glorious destiny. God's predetermination secures believers' believers' glorious destiny. This is the next phrase in verse 29. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He also predestined. That is, he destined beforehand. And sometimes in Scripture, events are said to be predestined. Acts 4.28, they did whatever your hand and purpose predestined to occur. Those are events, specifically the crucifixion of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.7, we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, a hidden wisdom that God predestined before the ages to our glory. The, The revealing of the glory of God's purpose in Messiah was a mystery that God predestined to be revealed. Events can be predestined. And in these instances, God knows what will be, says Haldane, because he determined it. God knows what will be because he determined it. Foreknowledge in in God's plan equals foreordination. 
if you want a good theological phrase. Foreknowledge equals foreordination. Why? Because nothing could happen contrary to what God knows will happen. God is the one who ordains all of these things. But when it comes to people, God's foreknowledge of people is his gracious choice to love them before they exist. And predestination is God's marking out their destiny before they exist. He loved them before time began, and he set out a plan for their eternal destiny before they were ever born. And one flows out of the other. Because he loved them, he predestines them to an end that is their good. Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Sam read it earlier this morning. Ephesians 1.11, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. And what is your destiny, Christian? Marked out by God from before time began. We are predestined, according to verse 29, notice this, to be conformed to the image of His Son. To be conformed to the image of His Son. To be brought into conformity with the glorious, resurrected God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. As far as it is possible for you and I, finite human beings, to resemble the infinite Son of God, that is your destiny. It is what you were marked out for. It is to participate in the likeness of the glory of Jesus Christ. And this is inward and it is thorough. This is not some superficial thing. As far as it's possible for finite beings to resemble the glory of the Son of God, you will. Jesus Christ, as we know, is the image of the invisible God. He is the image of God in man. You want to see what the image of God is in a man? You look to Jesus Christ. He is the image of God in a man. And yet, redeemed man is progressively being brought into conformity with the image of Jesus. We are being brought around to what humanity should always have been, to faithfully reflect our Maker his character, his nature. Listen, to be in Christ is an unbelievable privilege. To be with Christ, an unbelievable privilege. To be like Christ. Listen, there is no higher privilege that God could give to a creature than that he would grant us access to himself and conformity to his own image. You remember when the apostles, right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right after his ascension, they began preaching publicly. And then they were beaten for saying in public that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God and was risen from the dead. And the the religious authorities and the political leaders didn't like all of this. And so they flogged them publicly and then let them go and said, don't talk about this anymore. And their response... They kept talking about it. And they said, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Listen, you're going to beat me up because I'm with Jesus? That's all right with me. If I get to be with him, I get to be associated with him. Listen, when the, the believers, the followers of Jesus Christ at Antioch were first called Christians, it was a derogatory term. Little Christs. Oh, you little Christs. Wow, what an honor. I get to carry his name around with me. He's going to call me his and I get to call him mine. What an unbelievable privilege. The apostles knew this. John said that, um, quoting Jesus, to have eternal life, John 17, 3, is to know him. Knowing him. Having access to him and, and getting to absorb what he is like. That's what eternal life is. He, he, he's glorious. He's unbelievable. He's the greatest of all goods. And so to be conformed to his sufferings in this life is a privilege. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that by the Holy Spirit we are being transformed from one glory to another by the Lord who is the Spirit. That is, we are being brought progressively into conformity with the image of Jesus Christ even here now on this earth. And if you've walked with Christ, you've you've seen this in your life. 
things that you used to do are, are, are fading away and the ways that you used to think are being renewed by the Word of God. You're, you're being chipped away. The rough edges are being sanded down by God's grace and, and you are looking more and more like Jesus Christ. That is God's design by the Holy Spirit for you in this life. Of course, it will never be perfected here. And so Philippians 3.21 talks about our final transformation. When God will enlist all of the power he has to subject all of his enemies to his own will, he will employ all of that power to make you look like Jesus Christ. This is his plan. And all of this has a purpose at the end of verse 29, so that he, Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren. This is the purpose statement of the whole section, the, the terminus of God's plan to save sinners, the great end of God's knowing and predestining His people, the exaltation of His own Son. Jesus is to be the firstborn among many brethren. Uh, firstborn among many brethren means He is our, our leader and, and the preeminent one in the family. The fact that Jesus is willing to call us brothers and sisters is a staggering reality. But make no mistake, he's the preeminent one. He's the firstborn son in the household. This does not mean, by the way, that Jesus didn't exist and then he was born. And he just happens to have been born first. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that. Uh, the idea of a firstborn, the word prototokos, simply means the preeminent son in a household. It was the word for the, the firstborn over the household who had all the authority, all the privileges, all the rights of the household. This was a title of privilege, responsibility, honor, and identity. That is what is meant by Jesus being the preeminent one. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. That is, all of the universe belongs to Him. He wasn't the first thing created. He is the firstborn over everything that is created. In fact, John tells us that everything that was created was created through Him. Hebrews 1.6 says that God brought that firstborn into the world. And he says of Jesus, let all the angels of God worship him. Listen, no one gets to be worshiped but God. But God brings his firstborn, Jesus Christ, into the world and tells the angels, worship him. He is the preeminent one over all things. And this is where the grace of God towards sinners and the glory of God and the exaltation of the Son collide in infinite benefit to us, God is glorified in His choosing to associate with unworthy sinners. And all of this magnifies His grace and His goodness and His kindness and His mercy. These attributes that are pent up in His very character. God is a fountain of goodness overflowing to people who don't deserve it. Some may be offended at the notion that God would seek His own glory. Have you ever thought about that? It would seem, after all, to be sin, wouldn't it? I mean, it's sin for us to seek our own glory. Why is it not sin if God magnifies himself? Why is it, in fact, good and necessary and appropriate for God to glorify himself in this way? First of all, God is infinitely good. The highest of all goods, the source of everything good. To worship anything other than God would be idolatry and tragedy. It would be idolatry and tragedy if God were to worship something other than God, something lesser, something finite, something created. But it's idolatry and tragedy for anything to worship something other than God. Idolatry in the sense that it's blasphemous toward Him to lift up anything created to the level of the Creator. And it's also tragically terrible for us. For, for us to set our affections on something finite, something short of the infinite, glorious, good God, uh, is actually to rob ourselves of all that is good. But secondly, it's good for God to glorify himself because self-glorification reveals what one is made of. Self-glorification reveals what's inside of a character. God bringing glory to himself by taking on the form of a slave taking on man's likeness by condescension, humility, self-emptying. 
even being willing to associate with sinners, and then rescuing sinners by resembling them, taking their sin upon himself, being punished as a substitute for those sinners, if this is how God will glorify himself, if these are the reasons that God will bestow on the Son the name which is above all names, because he emptied himself, then what is it about God's character that's being revealed? That he is selfless, humble, giving. God will glorify himself, revealing that his glorious character is intrinsically humble, selfless love. It's what he's like. And for God to put that on display is not sin, it's actually good for every one of us. And if we're tempted to despise God for glorifying himself, we actually are revealing what is in our own hearts. Envy of God's position while lacking his fundamental character. This is what Satan did. We want the renown without the substance of what makes God actually glorious. And then we project onto God the kind of selfish, self-glorifying that we would do if we had the chance. The truth is it's good and beautiful and glorious for God to seek his own exaltation. God glorifies himself by self-emptying, unreciprocated generosity that flows from the infinite stores of his love. God glorifying himself by saving sinners is our only hope and a marvelous security. Listen to how the author of Hebrews describes God's desire to make his son the preeminent firstborn among brethren. For both he who sanctifies, Hebrews 2.11, and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which, which reason Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. How humble is the Son of God? To to come down here, associate with the likes of us, take our filth upon himself, be punished for them, and then say, you're my brothers now. Staggering. Perhaps there are people that you would be ashamed to associate with in this world. Magnify that feeling by a sideways eight. In terms of the gulf that God crosses to associate with us. And he does it in love. There's a fourth monumental act of God's grace that guarantees our security. God's regenerating power secures believers' spiritual life. God's regenerating power secures believers' spiritual life. This is what Paul says when he says, Those whom he predestined, he also called, called. This is where foreknowledge and predestination and the glorious end terminus of our salvation find their way into your life in time, space, and history. If you're a believer here this morning, you are a believer because God called you. And we looked at this last week. This is not the general invitation call of the gospel. Many are called, few are chosen. Are you going to pick up the phone? It's not that call. This is the special work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a dead sinner to make him alive, to grant spiritual life. The spiritual life is the the source then of things like faith and repentance and obedience and walking with God and pursuing him and all of those things. This is God's effectual call to salvation. It's the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus called this new birth. All the called of God are foreknown by him, says one theologian. That is, they are the objects of his eternal love and their calling comes from this free love. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a believer because because you have been called by God. And why have you been called by God? Because you've been predestined to that glorious end. And why were you predestined to that glorious end? Because God loved you from before time began. This is where life starts for us, being born again, this calling. Belief begins, repentance ensues, a mind, heart, and a will directed Godward. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Present tense. Possesses eternal life. You believe in Jesus Christ? 
You possess eternal life now. Eternal life starts at new birth. It starts at the call of God unto life. And he does not come into judgment, Jesus goes on, but has passed out of death into life. You're breathing here this morning, and you know that your body will fall apart at some point, and you will stop breathing. Nevertheless, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have already passed out of death into life. All grace and all of this to God's glory. From foreknowledge to predestination to calling to the fifth aspect of God's grace, God's judicial declaration secures believers' righteous standing. God's judicial declaration secures believers' righteous standing. This is the second part of verse 30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Justified. This is that great word, which is uh, part of the theme of this letter to the Romans. Justification is a declaration of righteousness. It is a judicial declaration in the courtroom of God's justice. This is where God, before all of heaven, declares the sinner to be perfect. (laughs) To have a, a flawless record. Not only not having ever done anything wrong, but always having done everything right. To have loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength all the time. To have always loved your neighbor all the time. To have never failed in any of these things. This is heaven's record of your life, Christian. This is justification. If we'd summarize the theme of Romans, we might say it this way. God declares sinners righteous so that they can enjoy rather than be incinerated by the glory of God. That's what this marvelous letter of the gospel is all about. God declares sinners righteous so that they may enjoy rather than be incinerated by the glory of God. This is what Paul lays out in, in, in uh, Romans three nineteen to 21. Uh, this is what he says in Romans 4, 5, that God declares righteous the ungodly. The fruits of that in Romans 5, 1 and following, therefore, having been justified, we have peace with God. Listen, if you are declared in heaven to be perfectly righteous and never have done anything wrong and have always done everything right, then you have peace with God. No more enmity, no more war. God is on your side. This is why God can say through Paul in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation is the opposite of justification. You're either condemned or you're put forth as righteous, justified. And where there is justification, there is no condemnation. Listen, this is all God's grace. God can't declare the sinner righteous because of what the sinner has done. If God were to base his declaration of you based on what you have done, he could only call you sinner. He could only call you condemned. There would only be eternal judgment forever and ever and ever on the basis of who you are and what you've done. But by his grace, he is willing to declare you judicially, finally, and fully righteous. It's justification. And all whom he called, he also justified. So you don't go on, keep on getting more justified. You can never be any more justified than you were the day you were born again. It can never be taken away. It can never be added to. It can never be subtracted from. It is an all or nothing act of God's grace for those who believe. And all of this for God's glory. He does what we could never do. A sixth aspect of God's grace, God's final transformation secures believers' eternal perfection. God's final transformation secures believers' eternal perfection. This is what he says, all whom he called, he also justified. All whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification here is that future reality of your perfect conformity to Jesus Christ. When you will look like him. This is when predestiny becomes reality. When our bodies and spirits are aligned forever with the glory of God. 
No more mixed condition, no more mixed motives, never again capable of sinful actions, selfish desires, wayward thoughts, unkind words. You will be unable to sin. And you will have a glorious physicality that is fit and designed for that glorious, sinless inner man. And you'll be in the presence of God forever. Listen to the way Paul describes this. I referred to it earlier, but you can turn to Philippians chapter 3. There Paul in verse 20 describes us as citizens of heaven. Believer, you are a citizen of a place you have never yet been. Heaven is home. It is where you belong. It is where your name is written. You are enrolled there. You have full status as citizen. And we wait for Jesus To come back for us. Verse 21, the Lord Jesus will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Think about the power, strength, authority that it takes to have Satan bow the knee and declare that Jesus is Lord. Think about that power. Think about what it takes for a broken world to all of a sudden be a new heavens and a new earth. Think about all of that authority and all of that power. With that authority and that power, Jesus promises to transform your humble state into conformity with the glory of his own body. What a remarkable security. Notice the verb tense of this last aspect of God's grace. Did you see it? Did you catch it? It's not a misprint. All those whom he justified, he also glorified. Past tense. It's past tense in English. It's past tense in Greek. How can Paul use a past tense verb to describe a future reality? This is not a grammatical mistake. This is an affirmation that God's plan will come to fruition just as he designed. It's as good as done. There is a grammatical category for this if you're um, you know, a language nerd and want to look up the proleptic aorist and you want to email me for other examples of this in Scripture, you can. But far and away, this is the most daring anticipation of faith that even the New Testament contains. How bold. To say that all whom he has foreknown, he has predestined and called and justified and glorified, past tense verb to describe a yet future reality that none of us have experienced. The Apostle Paul has not yet experienced this. Do you understand? The physical resurrection unto glory is still future. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4 have not happened yet. That's still future, even for Paul who wrote this. What faith, what confidence, what bold assertion from the mouth of God by the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul. And listen, notice something else about this passage. No one falls through the cracks of God's salvation plan. There are no cracks to fall through. Did did you see it? We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, called according to his purpose. Why? Because those whom he foreknew or foreloved, he also predestined. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Listen, there's nobody justified that wasn't foreknown, predestined, called, and ultimately glorified. This has been called the golden chain of salvation, and there are a number of these in the New Testament. This is an unbreakable chain of God's saving work. Notice, who is it that gets glorified? The justified. How many of them? All of them. And only the justified. And notice, who is it that gets gets justified? The called. How many of them? All of them. And only the called are justified. And notice, who is it that gets called? The predestined. How many of them? All of them. And only the predestined. And who gets predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ? The foreknown. 
the pre-loved. How many of them? All of them and only them. Every Christian and only Christians have these guarantees. No one is lost, as one has said, between the eternal decree and the eternal state. I want you to observe something else about these marvelous words. Whose activities are in view here? Who is the subject of every clause in these verses? God is. Who is the one doing the foreknowing and the predestinating and the calling and the justifying and the glorifying? God. Grammatically, theologically, and really, He is the one doing all of this work. In this great unbreakable chain of salvation events, God is the one doing the work. And listen, that is the security of grace, Christian. You couldn't do anything to earn it. You can't do anything to disearn it. This is the security of God's glory. Because God is committed to His own glory, He cannot violate His own purposes. He cannot break his own promises, and he is committed to the exaltation of his son and the surrounding of his son with a people prepared, a people for his own possession, to reflect his own phenomenal, glorious, beautiful goodness forever and ever and ever. It is what he has designed humanity for. It is what he has redeemed believers unto. We are secure by grace. We are secure by glory. This is a security that you could never produce. A security not contingent on you. Not contingent on circumstances. What does this produce in us? Confidence in God's plan. Gratitude for his love. Some of you might be thinking, wait, were there some things missing from the list? I was kind of expecting sanctification to be in there. Did you feel that? All those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also sanctified. Do you want to put that in there? It's not in there. And I think the reason sanctification isn't in there is because this passage is highlighting that unbreakable chain of God's activities. This all focuses on God, the actor. Sanctification is a two-part work. We're working, we're laboring, and God, by his Holy Spirit, empowering us to labor in our sanctification. Effectual calling involves faith and repentance. These aren't mentioned either. They're embedded in this idea of new life produced by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit brings you to himself, he produces faith to cling to God, repentance to turn from sin and to turn to God, and he empowers a new life that is in keeping with his own character bringing you into conformity to Christ progressively. He does all of these things. There are aspects of this unbreakable chain that involve us. And listen, if you're here this morning and you're recognizing this isn't the picture of my life. I haven't experienced the love of God. I I haven't experienced effectual calling. Is there nothing for me to do? Listen, there is something for you to do. Cast yourself on the mercy of God. Cry out to Him to grant you a heart of faith to believe, to be born again, to now possess eternal life. And you will find your name written in the Lamb's book of life and you will find yourself in this unbreakable chain of God's grace and purpose. Jesus said he wouldn't turn any away who come to him in faith. Cry out to him today and experience the salvation that no one could ever take away. Nothing could ever break And God himself will never change. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these truths, these limitless, glorious truths in the space of a few words. How elegantly you have said them and how inelegantly we have tried to understand them. I pray that they would resonate in our hearts, that they would be the fuel for our own pursuit of you, knowing that you will never let us go. And we would beg for the eternal souls of any here this morning who have not yet turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. May they cease self-glorification and surrender to the infinite good of God-glorification. It's in Jesus' name we pray.